So this is a topic that um, um, is important in, in, in many situations when we uh, cannot just deal with electronic dynamics or uh, total energies of the electronic system, but situations where electronic and nuclear motion are coupled. Now, there's many uh, situations of this kind. Um, think of photochemistry or photophysics. With standard lasers, you almost always excite electrons, take them to higher levels. But then, uh, in these higher, let's say, von Oppenheimer surfaces, the nuclear uh, uh, wave function or the nuclear wave packet is not in an eigenstate, so nuclei start moving. You get a isomerization of the molecule. Think of the process of vision, a right? very complicated uh, circular process where you excite the electrons because it's light, it's optical frequencies, and then nuclei start moving, and in the end, uh, uh, they come back to its original shape. Another situation is um, phonon-driven superconductivity. This is also an effect that comes from the concerted motion of, of electrons and nuclei. So how can we deal with that? Well, we have to face the full Hamiltonian of the complete system of electrons and nuclei. Here it is in full beauty. So here's the kinetic energy of the nuclei, nuclear, nuclear repulsion, kinetic energy of the electrons, electron, electron repulsion, and the electron nuclear attraction. And with this Hamiltonian, so in the following, I will always use the notation as the complete set of electronic coordinates. There's a little r double underline, and the complete set of nuclear coordinates is a capital R double underline. And um, so with this, in principle, with this full Hamiltonian, we have to solve the Schrödinger equation, either the, the stationary Schrödinger equation or the time-dependent Schrödinger equation if we have an additional driving force like a laser in dipole approximation. So now, look at this Hamiltonian. You want to density functionalize it. What do you do? Well, we have to find the densities and the natural thing is, to do is, well, we take an electronic density and a nuclear density. So, tell me, what is the electronic density? If you have a wave function of this kind. So, we have psi of R1 to Rne, capital R1 to capital Rnn. What is the electronic density? Suggestions? Yes. And the integral over? Which ones? Oh, the nuclei, yes. So all the nuclei, because we want the electronic. Density and E, let's say, of R. You remember the formula? And also integral of dr to uh, log yes. yes, exactly. Dr2 and so on. So we integrate over all coordinates except this very first one, and then usually we normalize the number of electrons. Okay, good idea. So this is the probability of um, finding an electron at point R. Let's go back to the stationary Schrödinger equation. We don't have any standard right. That's the Hamilton. What would you do for the nuclei? Let's assume the simplest case that we only have one species of nuclei 
If we have more than one, we can repeat the story. Same thing, right? It's normalized to the number. Okay, we integrate over all the electronic coordinates, and then these are two, and so on. We are at Yes. So, in the physical meaning of by the Copenhagen interpretation of the wave function is exactly what I said. Probability of finding in that whole electronic system an electron is R1, and this is the probability of finding one at capital R1. And yes, with this choice of densities, one can prove one by comb theorems. Uh, this was done by Bob Parr many years ago. You can write it down. But if you think about it, it's complete nonsense. Because these densities for any atom, for any molecule, for any solid are constant. They don't change with R. Why is that? Well, this Hamiltonian, full Hamiltonian of everything, is translationally invariant. And if you move it to another place, it doesn't change. It means, think of a molecule or an atom, the probability of finding the atom here or finding it here is, is equal. And hence, also, the probability of finding all the electrons is the same everywhere. How would you prove this mathematically? Very easy. We have learned in quantum mechanics one that whenever we have a Hamiltonian, we can always write the wave function as e to the i p center of mass dot r center of mass. Well, this is the usual definition of the center of mass of the system times the rest, it's called it little phi, which then depends on one coordinate vector less. So typically one would then write R1 minus R center of mass, R2 minus R center of mass, and so on. And we start with the R1 minus R center of mass, and so on. And then we have one coordinate less, because the center of mass coordinate is already one. Right? So we only go to R, these dots here, R, and N minus 1, minus R center of mass. And that's it. So, now, plug this expression in here and in here, and you can prove in one second that the result is constant. Because the dependence on R center of mass drops out, because it's the absolute value square, this is just the phase, and then the rest is n minus 1 coordinates. All you have to do is you make a coordinate transformation of the coordinates over which you integrate here by shifting each one by the center of mass coordinate and for each one of those coordinates you just shift it and then you realize you integrate over everything so the result is constant there's no dependence left but should most of your potential be dependent on should you that change it depends on the electronic and the nuclear coordinates yeah. on the difference. Electron minus nucleus, that's it. Yeah. Right. So it's, if you shift the whole system, if you shift the whole atom, this doesn't change. We are not used to it. We are always used to making the born oppenheim approximation. We fix the nuclei. They don't move. And then the electrons feel the field of the nuclei. Right? 
it's a totally different situation. Here we talk about the hoses, and you can shift it, nothing changes. So the probabilities are constant. But you point to a very good suggestion. Why not putting the whole system in a potential? Right? Something big, right? A kilometer wouldn't change much. So we confine the molecule in some well, large enough not to change the physics. That's possible. And then the density will not be constant. So if I put the molecule in a very large well, yeah. But what will then be the density? Let's say this is a kilometer. So very big well. <laughs> yes. So it will go to zero here outside, but then inside it will be largely constant. So what you see here is that if you do that, then your densities that appear in the theory are densities that characterize somehow this big external potential. Yeah, it's possible you can do that, but it's not useful. We don't want to describe the confining potentials, right? We want to describe the forces within the molecule. Yeah? I only wanted to show you some of the nuclei, the, the light nuclei, like the photon, mm -hmm. quantum mechanical mm -hmm. framework. Mm -hmm. Then the rest of the nuclei... Yes, the one could do that. It's kind of born hammer like We treat the like, light nuclei yeah. like the electrons and then the rest is born -Hotman. You can do that. Okay. Sure. And this theory will be correct? Uh, yeah, fine. No, there's still sometimes quantum effects also with heavier nuclear. Heavier nuclear? Oh, yeah. Superconductivity. You find it for any system. Not for electrons, but not for the nuclear motion. No, it's nuclear motion. It's electron phonon coupling. It's the coupling of the electronic motion to the nuclear motion beyond von Oppenheim. This is what makes superconductivity. And not just for light systems. You're right, it is, the effect is stronger for light atoms, yes, but still, so you don't get everything. You, you get a lot, it's a good idea, yes. Okay, so we could do this, but it's not useful. So, okay, well, why don't we make a change of coordinate system? Right over here. Right over here. Ah. Okay. So one other possibility would be, well, why don't we choose coordinates R prime, say R1 prime defined by R1 minus the center of mass and refer densities then to these coordinates. So it's probability of finding an electron at distance x from the center of mass. That's not constant. Right? Probability of finding an electron anywhere, that's constant. But finding an electron at distance R prime, that's fine. It's not constant. So that's a possibility. And that's written down here. So this is what I said before. This is constant for all systems. Which I R prime. And this density. is not constant, but it will be spherical because the probabilities don't depend on the orientation of the molecule. So these densities will be spherical for all atoms, for all molecules, for all solids. So it's still not good enough. That's what you need really you, what you want. You can always prove one by cone theorems for anything and for this as well. That's easy. 
But you have to ask yourself, is it useful? Right? And it will not be useful still, because only spherical densities are not sufficiently characteristic of the, of the molecule. Okay, so one thing that one can do is what's written down here. One uh, makes a further transformation to a body fixed coordinate frame. So one can use these Euler angles uh, that you use to rotate into the principal axis of the nuclear inertia tensor. And then you get useful densities. They look pretty much like what we are used to in one minor and one can in fact deduce the density functional formulation multi-component DFT on the basis of, of this electronic density. And that was done uh, in this paper. And um, so that's one possibility that one can do. I have to say that this paper is, as we understand now, 15 years later, not complete. It's only half of the story. And that has to do with the nuclear density, what one chooses as nuclear density. And I come to that in a couple of minutes. And before I come to that, I will first uh, uh, discuss some generalities, von Oppenheimer and all these things that you may have heard. And then I come back to this question, what the right nuclear density should be. So I jump over this. So von Oppenheimer approximation, this is something that, uh, that you all have seen before. In the Hamiltonian, the full Hamiltonian of the electronuclear system that we discussed before, we just neglect. Uh, the nuclear kinetic energy, so in a certain sense it's the infinite nuclear mass limit. And then in the remaining Hamiltonian, the nuclear coordinates only appear as parameters. So we can then solve, or we imagine we can solve the many electron problem um, for each fixed nuclear coordinate vector. And then the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions are functions of of this nuclear uh, uh, configuration. So this is what you, you don't get just one, but you get uh, uh, for each nuclear configuration, you get an infinite set of these one Oppenheimer states. So you have additional indices here that I just didn't put for uh, uh, notation of simplicity. So you get then these so-called von Oppenheimer surfaces. So this is how they typically look. So the energies here as function of nuclear coordinates. Okay, so that's the electronic part. Now, what do we then do? Suppose we have solved this for all possible nuclear configurations. What do we then do in the next step for the complete wave function? Well, we just multiply it with the nuclear wave function and variationally optimize this object. So we plug this in the variational principle and vary with respect to the nuclear wave function. And then this is what we get. So one thing that you see immediately is that this eigenvalue of the electronic problem becomes a scalar potential in a, in a nuclear Schrödinger equation. There's another scalar potential, which is this. So you have the nuclear gradients here acting on the subscript of, of the von Oppenheimer wave function. So that's an additional scalar potential. And in addition, you get the vector potential, which is kind of surprising at first. So it, it acts on the nuclear momentum operator, so this is what the vector potential does. Okay, and this vector potential has this form. Uh, objects of this form are called Barry connection. And uh, if you make a line integral around the loop, then sometimes you get the finite value which is a so-called geometric phase, or very phase. And you typically get this when the von Oppenheimer surfaces oops, um, do not look smooth like here, but when the lower surface and the upper surface have uh, a point, a so-called uh, conical intersection, a sharp point where they come together. So when you have this kind of non-analyticity, 
you can get uh, a berry phase. So it's a bit like, like in complex analysis, if you have a non-analyticity, let's say a pole, you integrate around it, you get to pi. Uh, if it's smooth, you integrate around it and you get nothing. So that's, that's very similar here. Okay, so geometric phases, this is a very general concept. It was first proposed by Panchalatnam uh, in the 50s um, in the context of optics, and then it was further investigated in the context of quantum mechanics, primarily by Michael Berry. That's why this is now called the Berry phase. So the general uh, uh, statement is that whenever a Hamiltonian depends on a set of parameters, in our case, the electronic Hamiltonian depends on the nuclear coordinates as parameters. Then you can form this kind of vector potential, this object here, and the loop integral around it that can give you a geometric phase. So it's a very general concept. Okay, so that was Born-Oppenheimer, or the adiabatic approximation. Um, there's a standard way of going beyond Born-Oppenheimer, and this is known as the Born-Wang expansion. And this is what's written down here. At each fixed nuclear configuration, uh, the solution of the electronic problem gives you a complete set of eigenstates. Right? And hence, you can expand the full electronuclear wave function, both in the static case and in the time-dependent case, in this complete set. So this is a formally exact expansion, and you get these coefficients here. Now, let's plug this into the time-dependent Schrödinger equation, and this is what you get. So let's first look at the first line here. That's very nice. That's just if it were only that line, it would be a nice Schrodinger equation for this nuclear wave packet. And there's a scalar potential that is one of these adiabatic surfaces. There's an object kinetic energy. So if we had only this part, then um, the nuclear motion would be given by some kind of oscillation. These one of my surfaces have a minimum somewhere, and then the eigenstates live in this minimum. And in the time-dependent case, this, this uh, uh, wave packets can go forth and back. Now, this is a generic situation. Nuclear motion always looks like this. It is to lowest order approximation, a harmonic motion, an oscillation with respect to some what chemists call normal coordinates. Here the simplest case a diatomic, right? What is the normal coordinate? One nucleus here, R1, one nucleus there, R2. The normal coordinate within which you get an oscillator wave function is the difference, R1 minus R2. That's the coordinate here, plotted to the right. Nuclear motion is always of collective nature. You have oscillations in some coordinates. You never have what you have for the electrons, that you excite in lowest order, like Hartree Fock or that you excite an electron from one single electronic state to another single electronic state. You never have this for the nuclei. Important thing to realize. Nuclear motion is always of collective nature. For electrons, you also have collective degrees of freedom. But they have very high energy. So that's the plasmons and solids. But nuclear motion, at least the low energy degrees of freedom, are always of this nature. Now, what is the right density to describe, to use then in, in a multi-component density functional theory? What would you do for the nuclei? So 
suggestions? Well, it's difficult, right? This one body density, right, it's not useful. And you can prove it, you can prove home back home, no problem. But it's not useful because it doesn't describe well nuclear motion. You need very, very complicated functional if you would do it in some one body nuclear density. Pair density, yes, you're on the right way, yes. But think of von Oppenheimer. Think of this case here. Right? If you have many nuclei, this is an n-body interaction. It cannot be written as a sum of pair interactions. So the natural suggestion then is actually n-body density. The nuclear n-body density. Quotations of use nuclear density is the n body density. We call it N capital R, so it depends on all the nuclear coordinates and it's obtained from the complete electronuclear wave function. by integrating out all the electrons. That's it. Now this is an n-body density. How will your Kuhn-Chan equations look like? If it's an n-body density, the Schrödinger equation that corresponds to will be an n-body Schrödinger equation. This is what we want. This is what this first line is. N-body because the adiabatic surface is an n-body interaction. Well, this sounds terrible. Nobody can solve an n-body problem. But actually, for the nuclei, it's different, as I emphasized before, because the lowest order well, the nuclear motion is, is, is an harmonic oscillator. So if you do this, right, if you choose the complete nuclear wave function, so it has an n-body wave function, and correspondingly as a constant equation, an n-body equation, you can do other things like quadratic approximation and you can go beyond the quadratic approximation by going a bit further. This gives them uh, phonon phonon interactions and so on. But that's the right way. You have to start from the collective degrees of freedom. That's the idea. So we want a proper one-body electronic density like we always want in, in DFT or TDDFT for the electrons. For the nuclei, we want an n-body density. So, n-body. I think you could look at Even that. Because the, the collective motion is still what the nuclei do, even if they are identical. Take the N2 molecule, identical nuclei. Collective coordinate is R1 minus R2. Not an excitation with respect to R1 or one body density. R2. Right. Collective density. Okay. So that's the main message. But that's not the whole story. We don't have just uh, this equation here. There's other terms. These are the so-called non-adiabatic coupling terms, nuclear momentum operator, nuclear kinetic energy acts on the subscript here of the von Oppenheimer eigenstates. And uh, when are those large? Well, they are large when these von Oppenheimer states change rapidly in the vicinity of a even nuclear coordinates. This is typically the case in the vicinity of these avoided crossings or convective intersections. So, what do we do with this? Well, there's a development that is known as exact factorization. And this I will tell you in the next half hour of my talk. <laughs> and then <laughs> um, you will find that these terms here, 
although they look infinitely complicated, they can actually also alternatively captured by an equation that looks just like only the first one, except that then the potential energy surface becomes a time dependent one. And one can do this exactly as a slight complication. We not only get the scalar potential, but in the nuclear equation, so it's only this first line, but we get the time dependent potential energy surface, and we get also vector potential, which has this very type structure. So this is something you can prove, and I'm going to show you the theorem here. So that's the half hour that uh, Whitehouse doesn't let me tell you, but, <laughs> but here's the theorem. Um, it tells that the uh, full electronuclear wave function in the static and time dependent case, this is the time dependent case, can be written as a single product of an electronic state which depends parametrically on the nuclear coordinates and the nuclear wave function. And the only thing that this guy must satisfy is a partial normalization condition. So this electronic wave function must be normalized to one by integrating over the electronic coordinates. So it must be normalized to one for each fixed nuclear configuration. So remember, this is like von Hoffmann. Right? When you fix the nuclei, right, then also the electronic wave function is normalized to one at this fixed nuclear configuration. But what we are doing here is not von Hoffmann. Right? It's exact. And that's what the theorem tells you. This is not a von Hoffmann state. It's something more general. And if you allow it to be more general, then this is an exact representation of the wave function. And then you get two equations of motion for these two objects. One for this funny electronic wave function and one for the nuclear wave function. And this is what I said before. So the exact nuclear equation then involves a time-dependent potential energy surface and the time dependent vector potential. And this is our nuclear cone sum equation. Right? Because remember, we wanted to get the <coughs> nuclear n body density correct. Right? So it's an n body spreading equation. Right? And this is what we wrote in this paper 17 years ago. It's not right. Seven, not seventeen. Seventeen, yeah. No, 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 no the other one. The, the, the one that I quoted before. 2001, I believe. Um, we wrote down as nuclear sorting equation, an n-body sorting equation, but without the vector potential. And we have understood in the last seven years or so that this vector potential, in general, cannot be gauged away. Sometimes one can. For 1D problems, one can. For one, only one nucleus, one also can. But in general, it cannot be gauged away. And this is good news and bad news at the same time. It's bad news because your equations become more complicated and the corresponding DFT equations then in are more close to a current density function theory or a vector potential functional theory. You cannot get rid of this vector potential. But it also opens up uh, very fascinating uh, avenues in the description of topological features of matter. This is a big topic currently. Nobel Prize in Physics was given for this kind of thing last year. Um, it's a very weird thing. So it has to do with this Barry phase that I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, also for the exact vector potential of this equation, one sometimes finds a Barry phase. So this is, if you wish, 
topological feature of the complete electron nuclear system beyond one of them, that's the crucial point. So in your density function formalism, you need to keep this vector potential. And then, well, since this electronic wave function is kind of an, a conditional amplitude, it's probability of finding the electrons at little r, if we know the nuclei are at capital R, like in von Oppenheimer, except that this is exact, suggests that we choose as electronic density, a one-body density, but not this funny one that refers to the body fixed coordinate frame that I argued before, but instead one that is a conditional electron density. So the probability of finding electrons at little r if we know for sure that the capital R is the nuclear configuration. So this is what we always do in von Oppenheimer without realizing. But one can exactly that, so to say, using this factorization approach. Yes, and this is exactly what we do. So what one ultimately <coughs> finds is, or what one ultimately does is one takes, uh, oops, where is this? This equation, it's disappeared, sorry. We go back to the equations of motion. So one uh, uses this as the nuclear quantum equation but then this is still an interacting uh, many electron problem and one needs to density functionalize that part and we have done that and as I emphasized before the vector potential this very potential appears in this formulation as one of the densities in addition you need the electronic density and an electronic current density and the nuclear density of that kind or the nuclear wave function as, as a whole. So that's the, the formulation and this is, uh, this is in, in this paper here, the density functionalization. And uh, so to explain all the details takes about one and a half hours, it's possible, but I, I tried to give you a basic idea of what, what this whole thing is about. And, um, well, this is not just abstract theory with this uh, kind of approach. You can then design mixed quantum classical algorithms that are, in a way, similar to Carparinello and uh, similar ab initio molecular dynamics approaches. You replace the nuclear Schrodinger equation by the propagation of classical trajectories while tr still treating the electronic degrees of freedom quantum mechanically using this electronic more complicated equation that comes from the exact factorization and um, this leads to an algorithm that allows you to treat even big molecules oxyrain here it's not big on the chemistry scale, but for me as a physicist, it's a real molecule. So it's it's called oxyrain, and uh, it has an oxygen, two carbons, and, and four hydrogen atoms. And upon irradiation with light, this can uh, 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 produce an opening of the ring in three different ways. And you can either have the oxygen go to the left carbon or to the right carbon or you can stretch the carbon-carbon bond to ultimately open the ring and you can, with this kind of uh, mixed quantum classical algorithm, then calculate the relative probabilities, the branching ratios of, of these uh, different um, nuclear motions and the most fascinating aspect of it is that with this algorithm you need not do surface hopping. You have the non-adiopathic couplings completely included. No surface hopping, you just propagate. And moreover, you also can describe um, decoherence. So if you look at non-adiopathic, if you look at non-diagonal elements of the electronic density matrix, and that's what's plotted here, you see that uh, while surface hopping does not give you decoherence with uh, this algorithm you get 
everything right, and uh, that's the last note I want to make. Thank you for your patience. What is C O R R F S H? If that's the fuse switch circuit yeah, so hopping, this is what is C O R? So for this is fuse switching circuit hopping, yeah. and correct it means uh, kind of decoherent. Ad hoc corrections to get decoherent. There's a few that we have invented, which is essentially patch work. So, I mean, surface hopping is already a patch, and this is another patch to patch. So it's I have done one. Uh, <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. well, with this algorithm, you get everything for free. Cost? Cost is similar to surface hopping. It's a bit larger, mm -hmm. but similar, not outrageously big. Yeah. What is CQ? Okay, that's the name that we gave to our algorithm. <laughs> it's coupled trajectory mixed quantum cost. And the, the important feature of this algorithm is that the that the trajectories are actually coupled. They're not propagated independently, but they, in a certain equation, they talk to each other. Okay. Yes. The left and the right uh, on this be just we can economize uh, calculating one of them knowing that they are. Mm -hmm. so one could in principle possibly. I don't I don't know how to do this. But uh, yes, you're right. Yes, yes. yes. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is about the epoxide. Uh, how does it scale with the um, number number of atoms? Because generally it's the kind of one we want to see what happens when we have a, an electrophile or a nucleophile attacking because this is how it generally mm -hmm. the process breaks, right? Mm -hmm. And so how does it scale? Because like this in, uh, in just the gas phase, I wonder how applicable it is. I mean, of course, it's important for your research, but how applicable it is for like uh, chemistry. Anything. But it's wherever you do uh, uh, surface hopping algorithms, no, so no, ab initio molecular dynamics, I want to see how the same way. Okay. So you do, it's classical trajectories, that's okay. important. So you have to propagate something like 100 or 200 classical trajectories. That's the number that we find is, is usually okay. And it's it's very similar to, to ab initio uh, uh, um, molecular dynamics schemes, so okay. Carl Paranello or Gernfest dynamics or surface hopping. It's very similar. And this can be applied to anything, basically. Okay. So the, no, bottle, no, no, no. the bottleneck is, is like always the electronic structure part. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, to what kind of systems it gives drastic difference between as compared to the ab-initial dynamics? Well, if you mean by ab-initial molecular dynamics, kind of Ehrenfest dynamics, yeah. well, you see it here. This this uh, decoherence, you don't get this correctly. Right? So this um, this plot is Ehrenfest dynamics and surface hopping looks the same for, for this case. So decoherence is one aspect, right? Uh, but in Ehrenfest dynamics, there's many examples where, when you have a splitting of the nuclear wave packet at an avoided crossing, right? Then the Ehrenfest uh, surface is the average surface of the upper and the lower, right? and this this gives you an unphysical uh, uh, dynamics. And there's there's many examples of that kind. That's why people have invented surface hopping. That with a stochastic algorithm, you hop between the surfaces. How is it related to the Ehrenfest dynamics? Because it's not which is also a kind of uh, exact Ehrenfest trajectory in this dynamical. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm not an expert on the Ehrenfest. Well, there. Um, not sure what GM means in this case. Uh, MCTDH, I know. No, no, okay, just got it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's many versions of. It. Yeah. But so, so um, ultimately, it should be good. If you if you include the non-linear vertical couplings, if you just one given surface and you propagate the wave packet, that's less. Sure. It's hard enough, but. Uh, 
and compared to the full ammunition which is spawning. That's another competitor. Yeah. That's where you kind of create on the way from one trajectory more to yeah. the In fact, we are currently working on making this algorithm more efficient by using spawning ideas. Mm -hmm. yes. that, that's also possible. Um, for for doing these sort of things with solids, you usually don't to do it well. You have lots of options that you need. You need to do all the various combinations. I'm assuming this doesn't get around that, or does it? Can you repeat the question? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Oh, so so when when doing like full on calculations mm -hmm. kind of things in solids. Uh, well, periodic solids mm -hmm. you have to do quite a large unit set. So you need to mm -hmm. get all the different modes and you have just the smallest area you have the perimeter ones. Um, I'm assuming this doesn't get round that. No, it only makes it better. Okay. It just makes the final result. No. Uh, this is something that I didn't have the time to talk about. But this is also one of our uh, uh, things that we've been working on. So, really good. So we have this exact electronic equation and we have the exact nuclear equation. So one first message is that this exact nuclear equation, as you make uh, expansion about the equilibrium points, uh, this gives you, one could argue, something like exact four knots. Not one of them, I should remember. The equation is different from one of them different surface. So we expand about the, the equilibrium points like we usually do, but then the surface is a bit different. So it's not quadratic. quadratic. It is quadratic in both cases, but, but the surface is different because this is the exact surface or not behind as an approximate surface. So this is already a question. The phonons can be different. And there's, in fact, cases known also in chemistry where non adiabatic couplings change the, the, the phonon spectrum. Happens. It's rare, but it does happen. One more question. But more interestingly, is the electron phonon couple. If you look at many body textbooks, there's always written the electron phonon interaction in solids in this way. Right? Can't be anything else, right? This is the phonon creation and annihilation operators. You have an incoming electron. CK Nagar, an outgoing one, you have momentum conservation, and this is the outgoing or incoming column. Cannot be anything else. But then you ask yourself, what is this coupling vertex? What is the coupling matrix element? And I looked in, I tell you, 70 books on many body theory. There's not a single place where this coupling matrix element is actually derived from, where you should derive it, maybe from the basic Hamiltonian of electrons and nuclei. We don't have any other. That's the right Hamiltonian. Has never been done. And the complication is clear. One defines normally the phonons within born Oppenheimer, and then we have already an approximation. So you, it's when people do things like they have the full Hamiltonian, they add a bond Oppenheimer surface and then subtract it again. When you add it, you get the phonons. For the rest, you kind of forget about it. So it's it's all wrong. Now, these equations that I showed you are actually a way of reducing something like an exact electron phonon interaction. And we have done that, so one can actually derive how this coupling uh, matrix element looks like, and I just show you the result. Um, this is what people usually do if you do ab initio calculations of electron phonon interaction. Right, so this is the gradient of the Cohn-Champ potential with respect to a nuclear coordinate sandwiched in Bloch orbitals. This is the matrix element that's used in practice by, by most people coming from linear response to VFT. But then there's corrections to it, like this one. 
which involves the derivative of the exchange correlation potential, so the exchange correlation kernel. It's not generally small, so this is a 15-20% effect. So this is something that we are currently exploring, how important this is, for example, for superconductivity and, and other aspects. But for the fallen alone, for the numerical difficulty to calculate them, it does not help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, we don't kill anything because we have only one surface. Time dependent surface. Yes. This is to yeah, ultimately make the algorithm more efficient, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have one uh, last question. Your electronic spectrum method, I guess. Yes. And DFT is. TDDFT in this case. Yes. Yeah. And DFT is known to be unstable in cases where you have uh, conical intersections. But these are exactly the cases that you want to treat with your method because that is mm -hmm. normally the not how do you get around that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So conical intersection is a difficulty that you encounter if you really calculate the adiabatic surfaces. If you try to do this with linear response TDDFT, then you encounter these problems that were mentioned earlier. In these time propagations, you actually don't necessarily do this. And if you look at the time propagation of the full electronuclear wave function through a conical intersection, there's nothing. Perfectly smooth. No, no complications, no topology, no, no nothing. It's, it's, it's a point that most people don't realize. It's a complication from, from the time propagation point of view. It's a complication that comes from the, the adiabatic basis. But still, the single point, yeah. it's close to the common. No, there's nothing. No. If you, pro you, you, you propagate. No, I mean, if I do just a DFT calculation, mm -hmm. and close to a conical yeah. yes. I, uh, I encounter a convergence problem. Yes, yes. You don't have these. We don't do this. No. You don't do that. No. Because we don't actually calculate the surfaces. Okay. We calculate the forces or the potential that the nuclei feel on the fly as a function of time. So what we have in mind is really the propagation of the full electronuclear problem. The complications that, that you're referring to is actually complication of the of the, the adiabatic basis. And then you realize immediately at the conical intersection, it's exactly the point where Mohn-Oppenheimer isn't valid anyways. Right? Right. Right. Yeah, so if you wanted to do the full problem, uh, you could expand or could use diabatic basis. And this in fact known that if you use diabatic basis, there is nothing at the conical intersection. And we have studied that in a recent paper just a couple of months ago. You can, you can see this uh, perfectly smooth. Yeah, but we don't do that either, because because we have this this mixed quantum classical algorithm, and it's just the, the the time propagation of the electrons of this in this uh, in this exact time dependent equation of motion. Now, you may ask, how do you get how do you get <laughs> But you may ask, how do you get in a DFT context the <laughs> non-adiabatic couplings? Because those are between correlated states. Right? And there, for that, we actually use linear response TDDFT on the fly. 
because you can calculate the correlated non-adiabatic couplings by using linear response TDDFT to a special perturbation. Exactly. What do you usually use linear response TDDFT on the fly? Yes. Along the path. All right. Let's uh, thank Professor Hardy again.